going to pick up our study in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> chapters 12 and 13. We were introduced to the main characters of the final act, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. They, the Antichrist assumes his uh, final personality, and um, we met the woman who represents Israel, the child, who, the male child who represents uh, the birth of Christ, the dragon that's Satan, the devil, and the serpent of old. We met uh, the beast from the sea, which is the Antichrist, and the beast from the earth, which is the false prophet. Those are the main characters of the final act. Uh, now, we're, we're in this parent, parenthesis period, and the next thing that John is going to get is a preview of the end. Did you ever go to the movies and, you know, the first 15 minutes or so you're watching previews? You know, there's only two things wrong with that. Number one, they show you all the best parts of the movie before you ever see it. And it's usually not as good as the preview you thought it was. And the second thing is you eat all your popcorn before the movie starts. <laughs> you have to get the big one. I'm always, well, I want to wait till the movie starts. Movie starts, I don't have any more popcorn. Well, we're going to get a preview of things to come. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's like a, a preview in that this is what's going to happen, but I'm just going to show you a little bit about it. The details are going to be found in chapter 16 through 19, and it's going to get... A lot of particulars, a lot of details. But tonight we're not getting so much the details as we're getting an overview of what lays ahead. And uh, beginning in the 14th chapter then, we see that uh, John says, I looked, this is verse 1 of chapter 14. Uh, we finished up on 13 with an introduction to the Antichrist and, and earth dwellers forced to have... Uh, a mark of the beast on their hand or on their forehead. And uh, we found out that the number of the beast is 666. That's played into an awful lot of movies, but we don't know exactly what it means. But perhaps there is an explanation that it's the best counterfeit of the perfect man that Satan could come up with. The best counterfeit of what Satan would consider the perfect man. Remember on the sixth day of creation, God created man. And so this would be the perfect man, or at least from Satan's perspective. Uh, wisdom will indicate later on what that number means, but we really don't have any inclination of what it might be. And so after receiving that information about the events and the, and the characters, then John says, I looked, and behold, the Lamb. Now, all of a sudden, he's projecting to the end of this whole tribulation. He skips over. Everything uh, from chapter 16 to, verse, to chapter 19, and he goes right to the victory celebration of the return of Christ. So he says, look, behold, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. Now, I want to flip Pearsham for a minute, just a second, to talk about Mount Zion. Uh, Mount Zion technically is a portion of the city of Jerusalem. Oh, I thought I skipped all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, come on. Well, there's the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. Now, the bold judgments are yet to come. They're going to start in a couple of chapters here, and, and you can see the, the devastation of them. Boils, and the sea turns to blood, rivers to blood, scorching heat, darkness. The Euphrates dries up, and that's a key thing to happen. And then a final earthquake and hailstones. But I want to look with you for just a second at, uh, all right, we looked at the middle of the tribulation. These are the events that happen in the middle. The battle in heaven and Satan is cast out, chapter 12. The rise of the Antichrist, chapter 13, we looked at that last week. The Antichrist receives a mortal wound and seems to recover from that. Uh, then there's the rise of the false prophet and the abomination of desolation when the the uh, Antichrist claims to be God and demands to be worshipped as God. 
and the intense persecution of Israel and believers. Those things happen at the, at the midpoint of the tribulation. Now, here is uh, the ancient Jerusalem during the time of David. When David conquered this city, it was called Jebus. And it was, uh, it was a well-fortified wall city on the top of, the, of a mountain. And in fact, the inhabitants were so confident that it could never be conquered, they said even blind folks standing on the wall could defend the city. You know, it was that impenetrable. They'd just stand up here and throw rocks at the enemy. They didn't even have to see them. Well, David took exception to that and conquered it. <laughs> and he made it the capital. And when he conquered it, this was the size of the city, which is rather small, actually. Uh, David made his uh, palace up here in the northern western end of the city. And uh, the city itself extended to the south. This was called Zion. And technically, uh, well, it's not pictured on here, but further to the north, there was a, st a stone that, that was supposedly the altar where Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. And that is technically Mount Zion. But the city became known as Mount Zion. And it was this section of it. Now, as it, as it expanded, and it continued to expand during the days of Solomon, uh, this was the city of David right here. This is David's palace. And these are the walls we just looked at. This is the city of David. Solomon extended the city this direction and built the, the temple on the mount uh, that David had purchased, the threshing field of Arnoth. And... Uh, he built, of course, his palaces and everything in between. So this then became known as Mount Zion. Uh, and today, Jerusalem is, is technically called Mount Zion. Now, in Revelation chapter uh, 12, verse 22, it says that we're going to visit the heavenly Zion, the new Jerusalem, and it's referred to as Mount Zion. So which Mount Zion is he talking about? He's talking about the earthly city of Jerusalem. So what he sees here, I looked and behold, and I'm looking at the earth, and the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion in the city of Jerusalem. So what does that tell us? Tribulation's over. The victory's been won. Christ has returned. He's standing in the city. Now, we haven't seen what led up to that, but we will. So John, for this moment in time, looks beyond the events to the result. Jesus Christ is victorious in the city of Jerusalem. And notice who's with him. And with him, 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Well, where have we heard of that group of people? Revelation chapter 7. The 144,000, 12,000 from each of 12 tribes of Israel are sealed. That's at the beginning of the tribulation. Now the tribulation's over. Christ is in Jerusalem, the capital of what will be his kingdom. And who's with him? The 144,000. So what does that tell us? In spite of all that takes place in chapter 13 with the beast trying to annihilate Israel, he's not successful. Because here they are with Christ, victorious in Jerusalem after the tribulation has ended. So it's a picture of victory. It's, it's a... Uh, an announcement of success in spite of all that happens during this tribulation period God wins Jesus Christ stands victorious and those whom he preserved stand with him 144,000 now I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of thunder loud thunder and I heard the sound of harps playing their harps now, I think it's the music that makes all of this sound. Uh, years ago when I was in grammar school, you know, back in the day, you, you took art for a certain period of time. Then you took music, and you had to learn the instruments of the orchestra. You had to learn the brass instruments and the string instruments and the reed instruments and the percussion instruments and the string instruments. And lo and behold, at some point during that semester, they invited an orchestra to come to our school. And so we met in the Gematura Cafferadium, uh, you know, where they take you. And, <laughs> and here, here's this orchestra. 
And so they show you what the stringed instruments sound like and the reed instruments and the brass and the percussion. And wow, you know, all of us are sitting in there. Wow, I had never heard, I'd never been to a, a symphony. I didn't know what an orchestra sounded like. And then after you listen to each of the sections play, then they played a symphony. And man, was that something to hear. The whole orchestra playing in concert together and all of the, the various sounds combined and the harmony. And man, it was just this sound that was, wow, I think I'd like to go to see a symphony one day. It's great. Well, that's what this is like. All of a sudden, there's this overwhelming sound, and it's the sound of music. Hey, that's not a pun on a, a movie or anything. Uh, the sound of music coming from heaven <laughs> with a great volume that's almost overwhelming. And I heard from heaven this sound. And there were singers. Look at verse 3. And they sang, as it were, a new song. And they sang in the presence of the throne, before the throne, before the four living creatures, and the elders, the 24 elders. And no one could actually learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So it's a unique song. It's a new song. And only that certain group are going to understand the significance of the song. We're going to hear it. We can't not hear it. Listen, listen, listen to the way it's described. But they will, under, they will comprehend its meaning because it will contain, the contents of it will, will describe what they have experienced, their faithfulness on the earth and what they have lived through. And so it's a song that apparently has been designed for them, for especially for them, having survived that period of time. Now, he goes on to describe this 144,000 in verse 4 and 5. He says, there were, there, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The word guile means deceit. They were truthful. We talked about that Sunday in James, about your yesing be yes and your knowing be no. I've thought about that some more. You know, I can think of two instances where your yes should always be yes. You know what they are? When your wife asks you, does my hair do make me look younger? Yes, yes it does. That's the correct answer. And then let your no be no. Does my new dress make me look fat? No. No, indeed, it does not. Your yes is yes and your no is no. Always in those circumstances. You'll live a whole lot longer. And life will be much happier. So there's no guile. There's no deceit in their mouths. Not only that, but they have been sexually pure during this three and a half period of time. Uh, what, remember, Paul and, uh, and charged the Corinthian Christians, hey, the time is near. Why don't you stay single as I am so that you can focus all your attention on the things of God? And that's apparently what these do. They focus all of their attention on the things of God. And they don't, are not distracted by marriage, or marriage relationships where you have to take care of somebody else. So... They received praise for their service and their ministry and their obedience for three and a half years. Now, he changes the scenes and something else happens. I saw another angel flying in the heaven this time. He was flying in the mid-heavens. And he had an everlasting gospel which he preached to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So apparently this angel appears and his message is a universal gospel not a universal salvation. Please understand he's not talking about universal salvation. He's talking about a gospel for everyone. The gospel is never changed, by the way. It's always the same. Christ died for our sins, rose again. Through faith in him, we have life everlasting. That's the gospel. And it doesn't change. But the interesting thing is we have this particular angel who is proclaiming it loudly. Now, as you say, well, how do you know it's loudly? Because everybody on earth could hear it. Everybody on earth could hear it. 
So nobody's going to say, well, I never heard the gospel. Well, by golly, you did. Don't you remember that angel that came and he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ plainly and loudly for all to hear? And every nation, tribe, and tongue on earth and people on earth heard it. No one's going to be without excuse. And then verse 7 says, I heard a loud voice saying, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment or the time of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And so now the announcement comes, look folks, this is the last of the last invitations. This is the last invitation. There's not going to be more after this because the time has come. And we're, when we start in chapter 16, pouring out the bold judgments, it's going to be, and Christ is coming back that quick. So this is your last chance. Listen up. Take heed. Be warned. Fear God and turn to him. But obviously they refused. And then in verse 9, another angel saying, uh, verse 8, another angel proclaims, Babylon is fallen. In fact, he emphasizes the fact by saying, it's fallen again. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, we're going to get to the details of that in chapter 17. But the announcement made now is, it has occurred. And you say, well, what's Babylon? Well, that's going to be the great debate. What is Babylon? Is it the city of Babylon in Iraq? When Saddam Hussein was uh, the ruler of Iraq, he began the rebuilding process of Babylon. And he spent tons of money rebuilding the city itself. In fact, he had a great festival, invited archaeologists and people from all over the world to come and celebrate the rebuilding of the city of Babylon. He even had money printed. On one side was the picture of Saddam Hussein. On the other side was a picture of Nebuchadnezzar. So he believed, I'm the Nebuchadnezzar of old, and we're going to restore Babylon to its ancient glory. And we know what happened in that situation. It didn't happen. So what is this a reference to? I think it's a reference to the literal Babylon, even though the city now is in ruins. But it, it stands for everything that's evil and opposed to God. So it's going to take on a personality of its own, something that represents something else. You say, well, we don't, that's not common. Yeah, it is. If we say Hollywood, what comes to your mind? There's an actual city named Hollywood. But when we say Hollywood, we're talking about something a lot bigger than the city named Hollywood. We're talking about all of the things that are incorporated into the entertainment industry. The good and the bad, and mostly the bad. (laughs) But that's what, we're, that's what Hollywood refers to. And so Babylon refers, yes, to a literal place, the ancient city of Babel, all the way back in Genesis chapter 11. The ancient city of Babylon, I mean Babel, was the uh, origin of the city of Babylon. And do you remember what happened in the city of Babel? They were building a tower up to heaven. Why? They were prideful. God said, listen, I'm giving you instructions to dispel and fill the earth and what have you done you've all come together there's one language you've all gathered in one place and you've built this monument to the heavens as a as a perpetual reminder of how great you are and God says well I can I can solve that so he changed their languages so they couldn't understand each other and they scattered like he originally intended but that was just the in the inception of the rebellion against God Babylon represents all of the rebellion through the ages uh, against the things of God. And so it's fallen. Now, when we get to the details of it, you'll see what that looks like. And we'll explain a whole lot more about the, the process. But for right now, it's simply announced. This is a preview. Guess what? Babylon's fallen. Now, you have to come back and see the movie. And we're going to get over to the few chapters. We're going to see the movie, The Fall of Babylon. So this is a preview of everything that's going to take place. And so, the Babylon is fallen, the great city. Now, verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine 
of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of God's indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment will ascend forever and ever. And they'll have no rest day or night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now that's a contrast with the 144,000 others who are believers. What are they doing? They're having a victory celebration. What's happening to these other guys? Oh man, unmerciful torment. Unmerciful torment. Now, let me look at something right quick. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a hymn that you're familiar with. And uh, when, I, when I read the first verse to you, you'll uh, understand the connection. She wrote, I mean, Juliet, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Juliet Ward Stowe wrote uh, <laughs> a hymn called The Battle of the Hymn of the Republic. You remember what it says? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. That's what this is depicting. It's time now for, for Jesus Christ to tread the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. The time has come. It cannot be averted. Vengeance belongs to me, says the Lord. I pay back. Time for vengeance has come. And the wrath of God is depicted like the crushing of grapes. Throughout this section, he talks about the wrath of God and the, and the, the grapes of wrath. Uh, let's see, where did we see it? And smoke of the torment. Mm -hmm. I heard a voice from heaven saying, nope, too far. He shall, verse 10, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of God's indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends, how long? Five days. Then it's over. Hmm. Forever and ever. There's no such thing as annihilation. You know, there are those who believe that when you die, that's the end of it. There's nothing beyond the grave. Well, that's not what Scripture says. What's beyond the grave is forever and ever. It's either forever and ever in the presence of God, with the blessings of God, or it's forever and ever separated from God in a place of torment. Forever and ever. Torment without end. And this is not hell, by the way, that he's looking at right here. Hell hadn't been occupied yet. It won't be occupied until we get to chapter 19. Then it's been occupied. It will be occupied. So this is not hell. This is what prepares for hell. This is them in the abode of the unrighteous dead, suffering until the final judgment and hell which follows. So all of this John is seeing is if it's completed, although we haven't got to the end of the story yet. we still got all that to go. And so he said, this is what's going to happen. And they will be tormented day and night, time without end. All of those who receive the mark of the beast and his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Wow. There's going to be more suffering for saints. Absolutely. We're in the tribulation. The, devil, uh, the Antichrist is not yet been defeated. And so the next thing we see is his persecution continues. And blessed are those who are martyred for their faith. Why? Number one, they're out of the misery of the tribulation itself. They're out of the, the, the all of the that, the that the Antichrist is doing to believers. They're in glory. They have graduated from this mess to a greater place. So right, blessed are the dead in the Lord who die from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works will follow. Now, I looked, and what did I see? A white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, 
having on his head a golden crown, and having in his hand a sharp sickle. You know what a sickle is? It's what's used to harvest. It's got a sharp edge on it. It's a crook on the end, and you can cut wheat, or you can cut you can cut anything. Cut your hand if you're not careful. It's sharp. It's used uh, in, in farming for harvesting crops. And this individual, the Son of Man, must be Jesus Christ. Where is he? He's sitting on a cloud. You remember what the angel said to the disciples who were on the Mount of Olives when he left? This same Jesus will come in like manner on the clouds from heaven with the angels. And now this is a picture of his return. And only this time he has a sharp sickle in his hand. Why? It's time to harvest the evil that earth has produced. And he's the harvester. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him. And this is the temple in heaven. And another angel came out of the temple in heaven, crying with a loud voice to the one who sat on the cloud. He's speaking to Jesus. And the instructions are, Thrust your sickle and reap, for the time of harvest has come. For you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. What's he saying? Evil has reached its peak. The cup's full. You remember when God promised Abraham that he would give him a land? That was one of the promises in Genesis chapter 12 and 15. He said, I'm going to give you this land, and your descendants will come back here after 430 years when the cup of iniquity of the Canaanites is full, God says, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to give them a chance. Perhaps they'll repent. So I'm going to allow 430 years for that to take place. While that's happening, in the incubator of Egypt, the nation of, Egypt, uh, the nation of Israel will develop from 70 to over 2 million. But when that time is up, I'm going to bring you back to the land of Canaan. And because of their iniquity has overflowed the cup, I'm going to destroy them from before your presence, and you're going to inhabit their land. You're going to inherit it, and you're going to inhabit it. Why? Their iniquity kept overflowing. Did they repent? No. They kept on pursuing the course of unrighteousness until the cup was full. And God said, I'll bring judgment at that time. Well, now the harvest is complete. The, the fields, the grain is ripe beyond ripe. It's almost rotten. And the grapes are at their fullest. What would happen in the ancient world? They'd go through the vineyard with a sickle and they'd cut the, the grapes off the vine, the clusters of grapes off the vine. They'd take them to a, a stone uh, depression. And in the bottom of that stone depression, there was a, a hole that would run out to another depression below. And then they would get in there and they would crush the grapes. They would stomp the grapes until they had forced all the juice out of the grapes. And the juice would run down and would be collected. And eventually it would be prepared uh, for, and, and for wine, as served as wine. So this is the treading of the wine press. This is the wrath of God being poured out on unrighteous rebellious humankind and their iniquity is at its worst it's at its fullest God has given them every opportunity we had the angel in heaven who declared the 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 everlasting gospel and did they listen no they didn't listen they turned a heart the deaf ear and a hard heart and God says okay how many chances do you think you get you know you don't just keep getting chances for salvation. Time runs out. God says he, uh, he has tarried his coming because he would that all men should come to Christ. But they won't. Eventually he has to bring judgment. And when it finally comes, this is what it's like. Thrust your sickle and harvest for the time has come to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the one who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle to the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven also, with a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had the power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice 
to the one who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine for the earth, up from the earth, for the grapes are fully ripened. Time has come. We've arrived. It's not going to be delayed. Now, we'll see the picture of it a little bit later. But I want to read you the result of it in the last couple of verses here. Look. So verse 19 says, The angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the, the vine of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. It's time for the grapes of wrath to be trampled. <laughs> now look at the result. Verse 20. And the wine press was trampled outside the city. And blood, ooh, kind of a gory picture, isn't it? And up to now, we've thought about grapes, and we thought about grape juice. But now we find out it wasn't grapes that were at the, the wrath of God was poured out on. It was people. And the wine press was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridle for 184 miles. What's this a picture of? It's a picture of Armageddon. It's a picture that we're going to see developed a little bit later. Remember, this is just the preview. But when we start looking at the movie itself, the picture that, that, that this represents, it's the armies of the earth gathered in the valley of Megiddo to fight first against Jerusalem. And then when Christ makes his appearing, they turn all of the focus of their attention toward him. And they begin to fire their rockets and they do fire their guns and they do all that stuff. But it's, it's, it's fruitless. How can, they how can they defeat Almighty God? Well, they can't. And so God rains down destruction upon the armies. Folks, there's a 200 million man army that came across the Euphrates River to join this battle. So if you put that many people in, we looked at that. We stood up on the top of Mount Carmel, those of us who were in Jerusalem on that trip a few years ago. We stood on the top of Mount Carmel, and we looked across the valley of Megiddo, the plains of Jezreel. And it's a vast area. Napoleon said it's the greatest battleground on earth because the generals can stand up on the mountains and see exactly what the troops are doing and guide the battle. And they gather. This is where they gather. And the wrath of God is poured out upon them to the extent that I believe this is a literal depiction of what takes place. The destruction is so devastating that blood actually flows down that valley toward Jerusalem. And it floods apparently fairly deep. And for 200 miles, the wrath of Almighty God. Jonathan Edward preached a sermon one time to his congregation called Falling into the Hands of an Angry God. And his congregation left weeping. <laughs> they were so scared about falling into the hands of an angry God that they left church in tears for fear that they would be the ones who fell into this judgment. You can receive Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Or you can face him as the lion of the tribe of Judah who brings the wrath of God to full hilt against all evil and unbelief and rebellion. And the consequences are extremely severe. Extremely severe. What do we little mortals think we can do against the Almighty? And why do we keep trying? Why in the world do we keep trying? Because of the hardness of our hearts and the blindness of our eyes and the deafness of our ears, Satan has deceived the human race into thinking we're something we're not. But in the end, it's going to be apparent who's who and what's what. And the wrath of God will come just as it's depicted. Now, we'll see the particulars of it. But in chapter 15... We're going to begin to get ready for the, the pouring out of the final bowl judgments. Chapter 16, they begin. And they come in rapid succession. 
And they, uh, they, 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 the climax of the bold judgments is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, we've already looked ahead to see that. <laughs> but we're actually going to look at the event itself as the picture unfolds. When we see the movie, we've just seen the preview. Wait till we see the movie of what takes place and the horror that it brings and the victory that it brings and the joy that it brings. And so the next time we begin the preparations for the end. And then in chapter 17, we, we're throwing a curveball. And we're going to talk all about uh, Babylon. You remember, Babylon has fallen. That, that was the preview. When we get to chapter 17, here's the movie. Here's what happened. And then we've got to discuss what that represents because it's very symbolic. And it will take all of our wits to figure that out. But I believe you can do it. All right, any questions or anything you'd like to clarify? Please help me clarify it for you. Hey, the stage is being set. You say, well, you know, all this stuff over there with Russia and the Ukraine and China rattling her swords about taking over Taiwan and North Korea sending so many troops up to help fight with the Russians and Iran taking sides with Russia and Russia giving them. Hey, that's just the final act being put together. That's just the characters learning their lines. That's what's happening right now. The main characters of the end time are learning their lines. They're forming their alliances for all that unfolds from chapter 16 forward. So we're, what I'm telling you is we're seeing it happen before our very eyes. Before our very eyes, it's happening. That ought to be, first of all, kind of scary. But second of all, exciting. Why? Because if that's happening, Jesus coming for his church can't be far away. It's got to be soon because he comes before all this mess. And if things are taking shape, then this is about to unfold. And praise God, we'll look at it from, a, from the balcony. <laughs> the balcony of heaven, not, not down here on the first row on, on earth. Not, we're not going to be up close and personal for the rest of this thing. We're going to view it from a distance and celebrate the victory in Christ Jesus. All right. No questions, huh? All right. Then let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the preview of things to come. And we realize that you gave us that preview just so that we kind of get in our mind and understand the sequence of events that are going to take place. Because in the chapters that follow, you're going to give us all of the particulars about those events and how they unfold in reality during the end times. And so help us as we, as we digest the information that we're gleaning. Help make it clear in our own hearts and minds and give us understanding. You said that those who read and study this book will be blessed. And we certainly are blessed. We're blessed to know that you are the victor. And we stand with you in the great day of your victory. And we thank you that you love us so much that you made all that reality in the person of your son, Jesus Christ, who loves us most and loves us best. In his name we pray. Amen.